Welcome back. Today we begin a series on epigenetics. Today what we will do is just do a general survey of the epigenetic phenomenon and the promise that it holds for modifying brain function. Let's begin historically though. In 1944, the first uncontroversial evidence that DNA is the carrier of genes was discovered by Avery. At that time, there was great interest in elucidating pneumonia, especially pneumococcus, the bacteria. And it was well known that infectivity or the lethality of this bacteria could be transferred from one bacteria to another. The transfer agent was then identified as DNA. So induction of transformation by a deoxyribonucleic acid function isolated from pneumococcus type 3. So these are the gentlemen who uh, did this work and eventually a Nobel Prize was awarded for this work. So this is DNA. Now how is DNA packaged in the cell? Uh, it took uh, from uh, the historical uh, 1944 discovery of DNA as the genomic uh, principle to 2001 uh, when the human genome was decoded. So we have about uh, 50 plus years here of development until the, uh, from the discovery of the principle of the genome to the actual sequence of human genome. Now the packaging of DNA, which is a humongously long strand into a very small space in the cellular nucleus, is a huge biophysical problem. And the way it's done in the cell is the DNA is complexed with a number of proteins, in particular a family of proteins called histones. The histones wrap around the DNA, histones being charged positively, DNA being charged negatively, and the different histone DNA complex formation are either called heterochromatin, which means the genes are silent and are not being transcribed. Transcription factors do not have any access to the genome, or euchromatin, where the genome is open like an open book and transcription factors can enter and induce transcription of genes from the book of the genome. That is the packaging, which is a tremendous biophysical feat. Here you see another representation. So you see the chromatin uh, in the insert on the right-hand side, and you see the three different histone uh, protein uh, complexes associated with the structure of the DNA. This structure is called the nucleosome. The nucleosome then needs to be unfolded and opened up for transcription to take place. Why is this important? Well, here again is the, uh, an electron microscopic presentation of a uh, chromatin complex. You see here heterochromatin appearing in this corner here, the dense condensed structures which do not have access to transcription factors, and here is the euchromatin, which is available for transcription at this time. Now, this fits in with a general puzzle, namely, we have only 20,000 plus genes. How come we can make all the variety of cells, liver cells, muscle cells, heart cells, kidney cells, and brain cells? from this limited repertory of genes. And in 1942, Conrad Wannington made a prediction. He said there must be some differential uh, transcription going on, whereby a change is induced into the genome which allows for timed and differential transcription. And that then, in turn, accounts for the differentiation of cells into multiple cell types. Here you can see the so-called epigenetic landscape, and you see these little blue balls running down this landscape here, depending on what is available at the time 
for access into the transcription machinery. Now, what we will end up with in the end is a very dramatic statement here made by Maloney in 2014. And it says that epigenetics, namely the modification of the genome, not only supplements social neuroscience by highlighting the molecular mechanisms that orchestrate brain plasticity and memory formation, but also seek to blur any residual distinction between biology and social ecological context. The first model of the cognitive brain was that of a computing machine, entirely severed from environmental influences, and the brain of social neuroscience still oscillates between plastic changes and hardwiring metaphors with the rise of what can be named the epigenetic brain or epigenetic research, the reciprocal penetration of the social and the biological reaches a point where trying to establish any residual um, distinction seems increasingly hopeless. In other words, the genome is open to such an extent to environmental influences that we can now combine social sciences in a sense and brain sciences into one combined package. So what is epigenetics and why is it so exciting? Well, if genes are the words, the words are stringed together in the DNA without really any punctuation. Epigenes determine how genes are being read. They are, in fact, the grammar and the punctuation in the genome. So in terms of the computer metaphor, genes are the computer hardware and epigenes are the computer software. And you can see in the picture here the epigenetic modification uh, can yield different cell types, be involved in the orchestration of development, orchestrate temporal fluctuation, the response to environment, eventually also the production or um, facilitation of certain disease processes. So here then is the promise of epigenetics, namely, we will understand how from one embryo, blood cells, nerve cells, bone, skin, stem cells are being produced, and of course cancer cells which in some way can be a breakdown, big breakdown in the epigenetic control of cell division and proliferation. So switching genes off and on then is the issue. How is this being done? How do we open up the heterochromatine into the euchromatine in order to give access to the transcription machinery? And here's how it's done. It is done by acetylating histone residues in the chromatin. Here is a histone acetyltransferase enzyme that does this particular modification of the histone leading to an activation of genes. Conversely, you can then deacetylate the histone, get rid of the acetyl residue and repress the gene. So this dance is off and on switch by acetylation and deacetylation of histone is the key to switching genes off and on in a short-term and structured, timed fashion. This was the first discovery of the epigenetic modification of the genome. Now, there are other modifications of the genome, namely methylation. Methylation at cytosine residues, in particular at GC island, uh, G and C being two of the bases, of course, and whenever there's GC sequence available, that is a potential site for methylation, and methylation tends to lead to gene repression. So here is another computer metaphor, of course. We have the writing uh, of into the genome by acetyltransferase. We can erase what has been written into it by deacetylases, and we can do the reading by acetyl readers, which um, transpose, translate the modified histone 
into a configuration that's accessible for transcription. So here are a pair of identical twins. They have the exact same nucleotide sequence. Why aren't they identical? Well, the answer is in subtle epigenetic modifications as it occurs uh, in utero and in the early postnatal time. In other words, all kinds of environmental contingency can be written into the genome. The old saying was, we are what we eat, which was formulated in 1826, and more recently we reformulated by saying, we are also what our parents ate and what their parents ate before them. You all know there's an explosion of diabetes in Western countries and obesity, and it's quite possible that exposure of the genome to certain epigenetic signals is being transmitted from parent to filial generations and down the road, uh, affecting how certain key genes in metabolic regulations are regulated. Here, for example, are the offspring of a uh, mouse. So these um, genetically identical mice are produced by m uh, moms that ate different diets. And you can see their kids look very different from each other. Genetically, they're identical. However, their epigenome had been modified by dietary changes. And you can see you have fairly fat mice and fairly skinny mice, and their uh, coat appears quite different. Which brings us to mothering or the epigenetics of early experiences in the child-infant diet. So here you have your typical rodent mom and the offspring, and this being a good mom, she pays a great deal of attention to them, a great deal of licking and mothering is going on, and this effect of frequent licking mice or rats uh, makes an imprint in the uh, epigenome of the offspring leading to different stress responsiveness in the uh, glucocorticoid receptor in the brain and the pituitary adrenal axis which has massive implications for stress resilience and stress response in the offspring. So here is then the picture again. This work is mostly done by Michael Meany at McGill University in Canada. You can see here parental care has an influence on epigenetic markers, especially methylation, which leads to different uh, gene expression and neuro different neuroendocrine responses, which then produces an inherited phenotype. So the stress response in the offspring, depending on good mom versus bad mom exposure, makes a great deal of difference in the response of the offspring to stressful events. Now to make absolutely sure that no genetic influences were at play, so-called cross-fostering or adoption experiments were conducted where the offspring of a good mom or the offspring of a bad mom were then raised by other moms in order to make sure that we can differentiate genetic from epigenetic changes. And in subsequent talks, we will go into great detail as to the exact molecular mechanisms that are in play here. Here's a preview, though. You can say here that tactile stimulation, maternal licking and grooming, leads to activation of serotonin receptors, which in turn activate cyclic AMP kinases, leading to transcription factors being transferred into the nucleus, which in the end by altering the expression of genes in the glucocorticoid receptor affect stress response as well as immunoreactivity. Here's a more amplified version of this. You can see low maternal licking here. This mom doesn't care uh, very much interacting with her babies, and this one is a very good mom. And you can see here that different epigene uh, gene signals are being transmitted laid down in the genome and here, in the uh, good mom, you have an increased expression of glucocorticoid receptor, which makes the system more responsive to feedback 
from circulating glucocorticoid dampening stress response. Whereas in the low licking mom, you get a, a decreased expression of glucocorticoid receptor, making a runaway system of increased cortisol, which cannot be dampened, dampened by the glucocorticoid receptor in a feedback fashion because the receptor is just not made in sufficient quantity and expression. Trauma. The 20th century and, as you know, the beginning of our 21st century are centuries of tremendous trauma, starting with World War I, World War II, the Holocaust, and here, of course, we have more recent events, um, the uh, wars in the Gulf Stream, 9-11, uh, the um, skyscraper blowing up here, the massive expulsion of refugees from Syria and other areas in Africa, uh, leading to displacement and a tremendous horrific amount of suffering replicating much of the 20th century that we have left behind only just recently. Now trauma has a terrific influence on epigenetics. In particular, the uh, epigenetic methylation of certain receptors in the brain. So here is a, uh, a schema which shows you the uh, insertion of methyl groups at certain cytosine residues in genes. And the stimuli that can do this are physiological, behavioral, social, pathological, toxins, nutrients, and what we should add here is trauma as a major contributor to lasting changes in the genome uh, expression of certain genes that are uh, probably transmitted down through the generation. What happens in rodents likewise happens in primates. So here we have the signature of maternal care in non-human primates. You see here a happy little baby with mom interacting in the environment and here a skinny and scrawny looking baby interacting with a surrogate blanket which is better than nothing but nothing of course like its original mom. And if you look at um, the uh, DNA methylation pay, uh, pattern throughout the entire genome, you can see massive changes according to whether you were raised by your original caring mom or by uh, somebody who is just not available and not interested in you. Likewise, social rank is a major determinant of psychological health. And here you can see that high-ranking and low-ranking individuals in rhesus monkeys have vastly different methylation pattern throughout the entire genome. Childhood abuse, another epidemic uh, associated with poverty, drug abuse, and other social problems, also has been shown to regulate the glucocorticoid receptor in an abnormal fashion, predisposing the victims and their children to abnormal regulation of stress responses in the brain. Here is an example where you can see that uh, the um, glucocorticoid receptor methylation in those uh, abused folks that, uh, that committed suicide is much different from those who were abused and not committed suicide. You can see that the severity of the um, signal in the um, epigenome has a predictive quality as to who is resilient in terms of surviving childhood abuse and who will wind up dead from suicide. Now this science has advanced to such an extent that we know exactly where in the uh, genome, in the gene for the glucocorticoid glu receptor, the particular CPG site is located that is altered in terms of the responsiveness to early psychosocial stress. And some of us inherent, inherit favorable um, alleles that are not as vulnerable to faulty uh, GC methylation than in other people. So we can ride out significant abuse because our epigenome is not as susceptible to wrongful methylation in a sense and alteration of our stress response. And this uh, apparently can be transferred through the generation. There is some
complication and some controversy, which we will discuss in subsequent lectures. And here you can see there are multiple papers now appearing on genome-wide epigenetic regulation by early life trauma. And here's an example just to highlight how pervasive the changes are according to trauma versus non-trauma. And you can see hypomethylation and hypermethylation can be assessed in the same subject and show tremendous differences in those patterns according to traumatic exposure. Here again is the axis that is in question here, the, co the corticotropin releasing factor, as ACTH, which produces cortisol in the adrenal gland. Normally there is the feedback loop shutting down this response, and there is a protein FKBP51, which is critically important in short-circuiting and rapidly shutting down the glucocorticoid response, and uh, alleles, polymorphisms in this particular protein, the regulatory protein, have been implicated in a faulty gene response in this circuitry. Here is a more detailed presentation of this, and we will look at specific uh, examples in psychopathology in this particular uh, molecular circuit. Holocaust exposure has been shown to cause intergenerational effects on this particular uh, protein. This, the methylation of this particular regulatory protein has been shown to be altered in Holocaust survivors and their um, children. Uh, Rachel Yehuda is really the key investigator in this who has been working on this in New York for quite some time. And you can see how far this has advanced. We know in which particular intron the methylation site has been located that carries this vulnerability. PTSD, likewise, of course, is involved in this. And here is another presentation of the pituitary adrenal axis, which we will discuss in some more detail, just to add that not only psychopathology but also immune response, um, inflammation response is different in victims of abuse, which has vast implications for brain function as well, as well as glucose regulation, obesity, insulin resistance, and other metabolic diseases. So this then is an overview over the um, promised field of epigenetics, which we will then expand on in great detail in subsequent lectures. We'd just like to allude briefly to the fact that epigenetic mechanisms appear to also be involved not only in psychopathology, but in normal function of the brain, particularly in cognition and formation of memory. Okay, that is it for today, and we hope to see you soon again at the ongoing sequence of lectures on the epigenetics in human brains. Thank you for your attention. We'll see you soon again.